Oh, does that mean that somebody figured something out? <laughs> Hello. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. It's Thursday. Brian here, and of course, I am joined by Daniel Payton. No, he's not a ghost. You're I'm not here. Seeing. I'm here. He's there somewhere. Um, trying to get our guest on uh tonight so we're gonna be playing around with that for a little while but welcome uh people are starting to pour in sorry about last week we didn't have a guest last week other people were busy doing other things so we skipped it so yes did i get slack for it yep i did uh, but that's all right uh mark allen hello welcome my aunt Valerie is here. Hello, welcome. I'm going to start putting some people's comments on there. Hello, Mark. Hello. Nice to see ya. Nice to see everyone. They're slowly coming on. Don't uh, adjust your screens because he's there. He's just off to the side. So he's on a uh, an author mission to get our guest on the show tonight. So, yeah. What's everyone up to on this blah? What's the weather, Daniel, anyways? It, what's it's your weather? lovely here. Oh, I sense some sarcasm. Oh, no, no sarcasm. I'm not walking oh, the park today. Like, it's an actual beautiful day there? Gorgeous. Are you going to be part of the heat wave that is coming? Yes. Oh, good. Well, sorry. Well, maybe you have an AC. I don't, but uh, that's all right. Uh, but it's supposed to be 80 tomorrow, like 80 in the 80s, high 80s. And then Saturday, oh, my God, it's supposed to be in the 90s. Yeah. I have no yeah, AC, folks. Yeah, it's supposed to get roughly around that here, too. Um, but, I again, where I grew up and where I lived the past most of my life, um, 90 is considered, you know, spring weather. So I'm used to that. Yeah. My friends here in Michigan are dying. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. It's below body temperature. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, I've been going out to the park. There's a beautiful park near where I live that uh, it's not too terribly big, but it's uh, um, very well kept. And they, I love to walk it. And they, it, it's just incredible weather. Now, it's like we had one beautiful, beautiful day on Tuesday. And the nasty, murky, gray, rainy day yesterday. That's and then a beautiful day. sunny day today, and tomorrow is supposed to be rainy. It's like I can't make up his mind. It's just gonna just pick every other day to be nice and every other day to be nasty. So, yeah, today was uh, a high of I think around sixty or something, but it was rainy today. Uh, but the day before, we have we've had rainy days, and then we had really nice warm days. Everything is blooming. Everything is turning green. Everything is you know coming to life. It's fantastic to see. So uh, I'm happy that warmer weather is here, but it's tricking us. It's it's mm -hmm. um, it's showing you a glimpse of what could be down the road a couple of months, uh, heat wise. Because come on, 80 and 90, and then I'll, then you're just going to go back down to you know 60, 70. Oh boy. So I guess two days worth is it's I can deal with it. Yeah. yeah. No, I I uh, um. I said I'm used to this to the point that after even after several years of living here, I still walk outside and it's in the mid 70s and the flowers are just blooming in areas and my brain goes, oh look, it's late March, it's early April. Like, no, it's May. Mm -hmm. But I'm used to a more southern feel. So when I walk outside and it's that temperature and it's that you know the the flowers are just now blooming, the tulips are just coming up. That's early April. That's where I'm from. Now that that's already gone past. It's now normally 90. And so I hear it's like it's this feels this feels right to me for this time of year. But mm -hmm. I live with it. And yeah, Mark Mark lives actually a little further north than I do. And so he's he's uh, old Michigan. Yep. So he, he can yeah. definitely have testified to a lovely day. Um, good, good. Yeah, I've I forgot having, he's up there. I have a, um, as I said, I love that park, but what's so much fun about the park is that it's a nature preserve, meaning that all the animal and, li and plant life in there, they try to keep native and it's protected. And so you have flocks of turkeys, you have um, 
all kinds of deer and squirrels and chipmunks. And after walking around there enough, and I've learned because I, I actually worked with some people who worked with animals and wildlife, if you wear the same color a lot, the color will identify you quicker than like face. They're not face, they don't recognize face, but they recognize like bright, unique colors. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I tend to wear the same brighter colors out there. And there's like a couple deer. There's one that I call mama deer because every year she has one baby and she's always walking around and, and, and she is so comfortable around me. I can walk right up next to her and she just kind of looks at me while she's chewing like, hi, I will never touch because I'll say no, I don't care how gentle and people friendly wildlife become their wildlife. You don't ever touch them. You don't feed them. You let them live how they're going to live. But you know, I'm walking in her park, so I'm going to, you know, right. yeah. be nice. And so I also have a few squirrels and chipmunks that I begin to recognize because they'll, they live in certain areas. You can see where they nest and I'll, I'll go over where they're at and they'll mm -hmm. just sit there and, and stare at me like, what are you looking at? You know, ah, looks like our guest found the, found the way to get on. So I, we're, I, had, we're faith. Sure. I had faith. Going to, yay. I'm like, technology, she's can be a technology can be a beast. Yeah. I know all yeah. about that. Uh, I mean, I will uh, let her know that, I mean, you're the first guest that this has ever happened to. So you win the prize. You win a prize. <laughs> uh, but I had faith. I, I knew that she was going to figure it out. I knew it. So now I can be, I can be happy now, but so anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll bring, you we'll bring our, our guests, our guest is Melinda Snodgrass. She's going to be on tonight. Um, and as you read the bio back there uh, that we posted beyond her mm -hmm. extensive list of current oh, published Lord, works yes. and all, she has written for Star Trek, the next generation, and which is a big, if, if it's a big deal, I mean, come on, it's a big deal to me. I love Star Trek, big Trekkie. Both of us are big Trekkies right here. You know, big Trekkies. So, uh, there's more. I just don't have, I just don't have it all. Um, you have more out than I do. Yeah, I've got, you got I, a poster I, I like or whatever that is. Wait, that's a puzzle, right? This is a puzzle picture. These okay, are, I remember. Eagle Moss Starship. I, yeah, I'm a Trekkie. They have been since. Well, I have. I think for my next show, I think we're going to have to. We're going to compare in one show and see mm -hmm. what you have back there because I'm not sure. And I have my stuff. We're going to. Yeah, we're going to see. We're, we're, we'll have a nerd war. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> fine with me. You said that you had, before we bring her on, I'm glad that she's here. Mm -hmm. um, you said you had some news? Yes. Uh, okay. I, I just finished. I have news, so I want to share my news with you, but I want your news first. All right. Um, okay. I just finished Motor City Comic Con, which mm -hmm. was a massively successful event. I had a wonderful time, met a lot of people, and mm -hmm. I had some encouraging experiences there. Being a relatively unknown author, growing in my attempt to become a bigger name, um, mm -hmm. it was really encouraging. I had people come to my booth here, which was a little artist alley booth, which is not exactly you know, mainstream in the, in these comic cons, I had people come to this just to meet me. And, mm -hmm. and they, and the thing is they found my books, what I, what I call organically, they found them just out there on stores or in, on Amazon and then right. liked my work and wanted to meet me, which I love. Now I'm a salesperson and you guys, you can imagine I like to talk. So when yeah. people come and now I can pitch my books with the best of them. And so I, I get a lot of great new readers by coming and they'll say, tell me about your books. I'm, I'm pretty good at that. So I love those readers. I love people who, who found me because I advertise myself, but having someone who found my work first and then came to meet me was just so encouraging. And after that, the big, the big news for me is that I'm going to be in Rocky Top Game Con at the end of this month. And then I just got signed up for, for Capital City Con in the middle of July for Lansing, Michigan, which is a comic con in our state's capital then right. i'm going to be yep. at uh, see here i'll be at smoky mountain fan fest in the end of july i'm going to be at F a fanboy knoxville tennessee at the very beginning of august which is literally right next to each other then i'm actually going to finally get to go to dragon con i'm going to be part of the bard's tower which is alexi vandenberg's mm -hmm. special tower for authors and he, he's, yep. he's he's giving me a little space in a corner so i can be there and sit amongst the giants and have fun. There so go. I'm going to be there. And then my, I'm going to finish up the year. Oh, I'm sorry. After that, I'm going to be in Toledo for a book fest. And then at the end of November, I should be in Indianapolis for a, another fanboy comic con. So mm -hmm. this year, my schedule is packed. I see and that. My big news is dragon con. I have tried for five years to get into dragon con and it's always really hard because it's, you apply and you hope. And this time 
I failed in my application again, but Alexi didn't. And when I talked to him, he's like, I got room for you. So I'm there. And I'm finally getting to be part of that. So my big news is I'm running like a madman. It's my big news because it's going to be a lot. And in between all that, I have three different friends having weddings. And one of them I'm the usher at. So it's just going to be a crazy, crazy summer. But I think it's going to be fun. So Well, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Dragon Con? Like, hello. I've never been there. and I want to go. But yeah. everyone says, don't do it. Don't let it be your first one. Because yeah, you, you, need, you need to be in the smaller one. If you can make it to in the middle of July to, to Capital City Con here in Lansing, that, that'd be a good one. I, my new... Well, I mean, everybody knows I'm going on vacation. Yeah. I, I've pushed my vacation. So I'm going in July. So I'm driving to North Carolina. Hmm. I'm going through Pennsylvania. I'm going to Hershey World to see the museum. I don't care about the park because I'm not running any rides. I don't. Um, I'm there for the candy and the tour and some merchandise. That's what I want. I want a Reese's hoodie or sweatshirt or something. I don't care what it is. And then we're going to keep going after that. So I'm going to the outlets. I'm going mm -hmm. to eat at Wendy's. Listen, I got it all down. <laughs> and then I'm just going to keep going. Um, but I'm making the extra trip when I get down there, the four and a half hour drive over to Tennessee. I'm going to Tennessee, folks. Watch out. Um, I'm going to Dollywood. Awesome. Man, I, I wish I was there with you. The just for the day now. Uh, I've never been there either. But I'm also making the trip 12 minutes down the road to the Titanic Museum. Yep. Because I'm a tan Titanic fan. Freak. I love it. Um, so, yeah. Why happens. couldn't you be, like, in Tennessee, like, during that time? Oh. So, I'm going to be there. Like, I leave the 6th. I get down there probably on the 7th or something. I'm going to Tennessee on the 8th, that Friday. I'll be down there and taking the drive, but I would have to drive all the way back. And then I have 8th, to go to South Carolina. 8th of July? Yeah. That's the first day of the Capital City Con. <laughs> Is so it I, really? No, oh. no, no, we, we're literally states apart. But one of these days, we're gonna we're gonna meet in a, in a comic con. But uh, you're gonna love. I will Dolly. make it. I will make. I will meet you in person. Don't you worry. Um, we've been friends for. Oh my God, Dan! I've known you for as long as I've been doing the podcast. Period, or this online thing. Uh, what seven years? Six, seven years now. Yep. That's how I met you, right? Yep. Rosetta Russell, a friend of mine. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So, and then I'm going to make the way back through. I'm not stopping at um, Gettysburg, though. Oh. I'm skipping it this time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you've read the Winter Wizard Chronicles, you know what will likely happen if Brian ends up in Tennessee. Because that's where all the crap started, was Brian in Tennessee. And it only got weirder after that. So, um, yeah. everybody get ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get yeah. ready. But I'm going to Tennessee, y'all, so be careful. Yep. So, all right. Well, that's my news. Well, there's more news afterwards, but we can talk after because um, no, no. we have a podcast to talk about because I have news about your podcast, by the way. So, oh, yes. yes. Good. Okay. I, I, I will apologize. I haven't had a new episode for my bookcast. Because I could have I, swore I almost uploaded chapter two on you again because I could have swore it said three, mm -hmm. but I read MP3 wrong. Oh, so yeah. it's like, oh, that's not chapter three. Oh, thank no, God. No, unfortunately, I was going to do it, but when you're doing a Comic Con, your voice is destroyed. And so yeah, I, no, I was like, if mother. I read this yeah. through, I will be hoarse for a I remember week. that you were busy. Yeah, and that's why I so didn't. Do it. I will try yeah. to get one recorded this week and get it. And so we'll have another episode, but I think it's going to have some, we're going to have like breaks in between you because like the following week at Rocky Top, I'm not going to be able to do one for that week. So I do breaks. Um, I, so, I still but, have to write chapter nine, so trust me, you're not far behind. So, guys, don't worry, it's coming, but it's it's all hindering on what I've got going on in my, my regular life. But so, what's the news about my podcast? Oh, well, it'll soon, hopefully, be available on. Well, right now, it's on Google, Google mm. Podcasts, so you can listen to it on Google Podcast. Um, the other one was um, iHeartRadio, Spotify. Um, and 
I need information for you for um, Apple, but it's also going to be hopefully on Kindle, Amazon. Nice. So you should get an email about that, though, sir. It's going to be on you, though. I put your email address in there, but yeah, I submitted it. Good to know. We send all kinds of email about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't get enough of me talking in person or talking on here or talking at a Comic Con, you can listen to me on podcast across all these platforms. That's right. Yeah, I never too. thought I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Okay. So okay. we have we have gab long enough. Um, That's right. We have, as I said, we have an author coming on here that uh, has quite an extensive list of books and credits, and we're excited to have her on here. She had she achieved something that I dreamed of throughout a decade, and I'm excited to meet her on this. So we put her on the screen here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, hi. Sorry about the confusion and the tech issues, but finally my computer started working. So here I am. Hi. And hi. I don't have helmet head anymore. I was over with the horse. So <laughs> horses. Anyway, yeah. hi. <laughs> gentlemen. Hi. Yeah, I know. As I say, that uh, a lot of people that I've got on here who've not done this before, they don't realize you, sometimes you have to update Google or something because it, it is permissions stop, don't work right. It's technology. Um, as I tell people, I'm an author. Big glowy box makes magic words. That's all I know. So I would, I would sacrifice small animals to this thing if I thought it would help, but yeah. you know, we got it working. So here I am here. So since you are here, why don't we start with what I like to say, um, introduce yourself and a little bit about yourself. Um, hi, I'm Melinda Snodgrass. I'm an author and a screenwriter. Um, I'm a reformed lawyer. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up with science fiction. And uh, when I decided to quit being a lawyer and become a writer, it was, I knew I was going to write. I mean, I was going to write science fiction. That was what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, even though I worked on Star Trek, Star Wars is my thing. I love Star Wars. Um, and Doctor Who, and you know, I play video games. Basically, I'm a giant geek, so, um, and proud of that. <laughs> so that's, you know, we'll start there. Um, I have horses, I ride dressage. Um, I studied opera in Vienna, Austria. I had a little hard time figuring out what I wanted to be, and I grew up until I found writing which is the thing I most love in the world. So yeah, so we have a we have Doctor Who fans. I, I am like you, uh, a, a cross section of most of the genre stuff. I love Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Wars. Uh, some of the smaller things, I mean, I love, I love Babylon 5, I liked Andromeda, you know, things like the old, the old sci-fi. Um, I think the only, only thing in modern fandoms that I just never got into was, Bolt was the anime. Um, I know about it, but not my thing. And stuff like Game of Thrones. I, I, I like more young adult geared, even the entertainment. And so Game of what Thrones just wrong? never really got to me. What's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Doing? I don't, I don't, I What's say that publicly now. It used to be a problem. I'd have authors and people in the fantasy. I'm like, oh, come on. It's the best ever. I'm like, it's okay not to like something. No, I know. I know. I love it. I love it. Oh my God. I can't wait for the. Woo. Oh, for House of the Dragon, yeah. Um, yes. Um, George is a very dear friend of mine. We've been friends for a long time. He's actually the person who got me into Hollywood. So, um, and uh, we do a book series together called Wild Cards that yeah, yeah. co-created together and I co-edit with George. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was over at George's house two nights ago. So I'm um, watching a short film that, uh, that he's doing, uh, having made, but anyway, um, yeah, so, but I, I get it. I mean, George kind of reinvented high fantasy by making mm -hmm. it dark and gritty, um, mm -hmm. which, and and if that's not your jam, you know, that's okay. <laughs> not everybody has to go for, and, and a lot of young authors who tried to emulate George, I think took away the wrong lesson from, mm -hmm. from his books and they just became more violent and, you know, more gruesome. And yeah. that isn't what made, Game of Thrones, you know, what it was. I, I, you know, yes, that was part of it, but um, I think it was just the wrong lesson to take away. I really do. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I won't discredit what he's done 
at all. Yeah. I will never talk down about what he says. It's like people want me. Um, I'll go on author panels and small comic cons, and I'll talk about fantasy and sci-fi in general, writing particularly, and I'll have that snotty person get up there and try to get me to bash Twilight. Because the vampire fiction was ruined because of the spark. And it's like going up, and I'm like, stop. Stop right there. We're not here to take other authors and tear them to pieces. That's not why I'm standing up here. If you want to do that, go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate anybody who has the gall to write, publish, and get out there. So many people walk up to me at Comic Cons going, oh, yes, I'm a writer. I'm working on a book. I'm like, and my first words are, how long have you been working on it? Like 20 years. I'm like, 10 or 12 years. Yeah. I, no. I mean, I respect the difficulty, but finish it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, that's the. That's the key to this business, you know, it really is, is um, the ability to actually start and finish. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm an architect. I outline everything. I don't start a project unless I know the ending. Um, mm -hmm. because if I don't know the ending. It's going to be, you know, mass confusion. And partly, you know, it's, I do did that anyway. And then once I went to Hollywood and learned how to break a story or a script in the Hollywood style, um, I became even more, you know, devoted to that, that particular skill. Cause I get up in the morning, I come in, I look at my outline. I know exactly the scene I have to write <laughs> or scenes, you know, depending on it. And, and it just, um, then it's a job, which it has to be because mm -hmm. that's how I make my living. You know. Yep. I mean, I, and that's something I learned actually, I've watched several lectures with Brandon Sanderson and I like, I, and what I've, how I've always written, but what he talked about was that, uh, what, Plancer that mix between plotting and pantser. And um, but I have to uh, you're like you ever since I was writing, I had to know the end. And I had people who would actually say, Oh, no, you don't. I'm like, but no, I do. Yeah, if I, I don't know where the characters are going to end up, it's like I don't know how to write their story. But right. I I can't sit down and write every detail. And I know people who plot to an outline that the outline itself is is as int intricate as a massive equation. And I'm like, that I can't do. I have to let the characters take me on their journey. But if they start to rabbit hole this direction, I'm going to shove them back towards the plot because I've got, already know where they're supposed to be. So that's yeah. me. No, Hollywood, you do have to. Um, you do have to have every. I mean, you know, you can't obviously mm -hmm. do that for a novel. I don't put every scene in. I put in what I call the tentpole scenes, the big mm -hmm. important scenes that are going to get me to that conclusion that I know mm -hmm. I'm looking for. Um, when I'm doing a screenplay, when I'm in a writer's room on a TV show, we lay out every single scene, you know, each act, every yeah. scene, everything has to be there. Um, I mean, for one thing, because they start, they start sort of pre-production off of that initial outline <laughs> and to have some idea of, oh yeah, we, we're going to have to go find this location or, you know, so they have to have some idea uh, before the script is even written. It, it helps your staff, your crew um, to do the things they need to do. I have a question. Yeah. So, so now that now that we're we're actually speaking to somebody, uh, I'm. I think I've had people guests on before that have done uh, written for TV, but I don't know the process. So, I mean, do they come to the writers and say, "I need we're thinking this, this, and this, and we need you to write something"? Like, what is the process of writing an episode of a TV show? Well, there's two. I mean, there used to be freelancers who would get a chance to come in and sell a script. That is less common now, especially with streamers. Normally what happens is that um, a showrunner, a, a creator comes up with a show idea. You know, let's say I've created, I'm, I'm creating, you know, wild cards for, mm -hmm. uh, for a TV series. The first thing that happens is we go out, my manager, and we try to sell it to a network or a, start, we, we started a studio. Will the studio back this project? And if you get a studio on board, then you go out and you sell it to a network, to a streamer. Once you've done that, now I've created this show and they say, okay, go hire your writing staff, Melinda. You, you know, we have enough budget for you to hire, you know, four other people say. So mm -hmm. then uh, we will put out the word to the various agencies and management companies that we're looking for, you know, I'm looking for four writers um, to work on a new science fiction show about superheroes or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then I will be sent scripts to read and the studio will also, and the streamers will also be looking at that, those scripts. And I'll say, I like this person, this person, this person, and you try to put together. And then the ones that you like and can all agree on, it is a very collaborative thing. 
-hmm. then you have interviews. You go in, you meet the showrunner, you sit down with them and you say, hi, you know, here's, I love your story idea. I'd like to be on your show. And if it looks like a good mix, and there's something that's alchemy when you're putting together a writer's room, because there needs to be a lot of energy, creative energy, but also real synergy that people get along well. I mean, a bad mm -hmm. writer's room is one of the worst things you can imagine. Mm. So once you put together, and I love being in a writer's room. I, I, it is just so much fun to be with a lot of other super creative people, and you're all working to create great television. Um, so then, and the showrunner, the creator of the show, you know, has a sense of what that arc of the first season looks like. Um, especially with the streamers that are only eight or 10 episodes, you're kind of like, well, okay, um, you know, I know we're starting here and the season ends here and now we need to work on episode three and when, and, and you have an idea of what's going to happen. So then you all plot, you work together to plot it. And then you assign that script to one of the writers to go write. Um, and that's, but it's normally given to people who have been hired and are on the show. Um, now in the old days, freelancers, we used to hire and bring in people and it was a really good process for letting new young writers break in. And unfortunately that's sort of disappearing now. Yeah. And, and instead you need to be on a show and then you're, you know, you're assigned the script. And the thing I always tell writers is um, if you cannot stand to have your, your work touched and messed with, do not go to Hollywood. Because uh -huh. what's gonna happen is you turn in your script and then um, you're gonna get notes and do a second draft if, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And then normally the showrunner is gonna take that script and rewrite it, do a polish on it because they created the show. They know these, the show even better than you can, even though you're on staff because these are characters they created. It's a world they created. Hi, Loki just came to join us. Um, the <laughs> and, yes. and so, you know, that's, um, it, it, you are going to be rewritten. Now I've been very fortunate. I, I was, I've only been rewritten once in my entire career, which was nice. Um, yeah. crap. But, um, typical author with a cat. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it's just something that if you can't tolerate that, then you want to be a novelist. You don't want to try to go to Hollywood because, right, yeah. And, and the notes, I mean, even after the script comes in, you're going to get notes from the studio. You're going to get notes from the streamer. You're going to get notes from the actors. You're going to get notes from the director. Everybody has an opinion. Um, and it's, you know, working in that collaborative setting is very, very different from, you know, getting to sit and say, okay, I'm writing a book, <laughs> you know, and it's all mine. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but that's, I mean, and the other thing I tell people is if you really, really want to do this, you need to move to Los Angeles. I mean, that's sort of the the sad fact. Now, you know, I'm starting, we have a lot of film work here in New Mexico, and I'm actually developing a couple of TV series that will shoot in New Mexico. You know, we hope that we'll get them set up. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not, but it's because I have, um, I have a career. I mean, if I were trying to start out now, the first thing I'd do is without any credentials, I would move to Los Angeles. So, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, one of the things you said something there that I, I actually tried to get across to some some authors recently, and that was that they they a lot of authors, especially unpublished authors, are under the impression that if they don't self publish, if they try to find a traditional publisher, small or large, that their book, the, all the content will be rewritten by the publisher. Uh, and I, what? I, I hear <laughs> I hear that all the time. Like it's my book. I don't want them changing my book. I'm like. They'll edit it. What are you talking about? And I hear, I've heard that for years. Like, oh, they're going to make me do this with the characters. They won't let me do that. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> no. Now, I, if, I can assure you, they won't. The only ones I know of that I've ever heard anybody say that were people who work with like with like Star Trek and Star Wars stuff in the in the publishing. And the company says we want a story about Kenobi and this and this. And you write the story, yeah. It's like a screenplay. It's like it's like a studio. They're gonna sit there. They are a studio. They're gonna sit there and go, okay, that's good. Yeah. But we needed him to do this. But we, you know, that makes yeah. sense. But if you're writing, it's your book. Yeah, they might edit it, and their editor will make suggestions like maybe you shouldn't have her wearing pink all the way through. You know, something like that. Maybe, but 
not like what they think. And I, and I think there's a lot of people who go indie and it's fine to self publish. I'm not going to bash that at all. I did that. I have several actually out, but I think if that's your reason, you're like misunderstanding publishing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and a good editor, I mean, only makes your work better. I mean, um, yes. one of my Carolingian books, I had a big subplot running through it. And the editor said, you know, this is really slowing down the book. And I think you need to pull it out and save it as a short story or some other thing. And um, and I did. And the book streamlined, it became a much better book. So, no, editors are your friend. They're not trying to make mm -hmm. it. They're not trying to harm anything. They're trying to give you the best chance to create the best possible book that finds its readership. Um, and not everybody likes everything. I mean, you know, some yeah. that's why there are 31 flavors. You know, some people want tutti frutti and some people want vanilla, you know. And, and so you can't be discouraged by the fact that, um, again, not everybody's going to love your book. Um, that's just the the. And that's the other piece of advice I often give when I'm teaching is do not read reviews. Do not read reviews. I just, I cannot, I mean, Connie Willis, who's a very good friend of mine and is the most decorated science fiction writer in the field, has won more Hugos and Nebulas than any other writer. She and I were talking and we never read reviews because the good ones just give you a salt head and the bad ones just make you terribly upset and you can't do anything about it because the book has been published. So, you know, it's like, don't do it to yourself. You know, just if you, if you want feedback before you send the book in to be published, um, join a good writer's group. I was in a writer's group for years with George Martin and Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. And, you know, I mean, it was Walter John Williams. And I learned so much working with them and getting their feedback. Um, but, you know, I know some people say, well, reading reviews tells you not to make those mistakes the next time. But man, they just mostly they just hurt. <laughs> so I'm like, don't. don't mm -hmm. rest yours. I can't tell you. Yeah, there. I can tell you right now reviews that were put on bad reviews that I read years ago. I know those. The good reviews. And they're in I'm your head. Fine. They? Yeah, yeah, they're just like an earworm. You know, they won't go away. So. Yeah. And I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever learned something from a bad review about my work or how to pr improve myself. Yeah, I know. And, hmm, and they come down to, wow, this really sucked. And it's like, not helpful. You know, I don't, yeah. that doesn't give me an idea of what it was that wasn't working. And again, not everybody likes everything. So, you know. Yeah, I think the last one, I finally, I finally shut that door a while back. But the last <laughs> one I read was on, I have a Christian sci-fi book. And the person reviewed it and they gave it, you know, four stars. It was really good up till the very last paragraph. They bashed it because they said the characters were too um, easy. The, the characters said things like fool and stupid where they should be swearing. These are bad characters doing bad things. And I'm like, I, I, I didn't get mad, but I thought to myself, I didn't. When I wrote it, it was actually more hardcore. My publisher, who's a Christian publishing house, is like, I'm sorry, we don't want that in our books. So they put, in fact, they they changed it so badly at one point that I went back and I rewrote scenes so there was no dialogue because the dialogue they put in here, and, and I'll give you the example that it just kills me, is the bad guy in this book is committing genocide. All right. He is purposely he killed one person to take over a weapon station and is blowing the crap out of a planet to kill all the people so they can't testify against him. And in this scene, he's he swears. And my editor changed it to him going, gosh, darn it. <laughs> no, I, I'm like, I changed that line, too. <laughs> when, when did Beaver Cleaver get so evil? I mean, it was like, this is not right. So I, I, I was like, no, 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 no. So I took the whole dialogue out of that scene just and put it into just, you know, the the whole paragraph description was there then you got a better inference but when, when i read that I, i'm here at home and i started laughing so hard that people here were like is there something wrong with you and i just like you got to read this you've got to read this this is hilariously stupid but it wasn't me so when i read that i realized it their review of it is off something that somebody else did to it i can't I, and, and i can't change that and i don't think it makes the book any worse I mean, seriously. Yeah, I mean, well, and for the market, they know their readership. I mean, yes. that, that's the thing. You know, you trust your, you trust your publisher. And um, hi, you're driving me. me yeah, hi. Yeah. You, yeah. 
Hi, Loki. <laughs> I've always wanted a Siamese cat. I, I, I uh, went onto your website, so, you know, I obviously have an inkling of who's coming onto the show. Uh, <laughs> so I saw all the pictures, and then I clicked your Facebook, and so I know <laughs> Loki is. and the horse. And Yandu, and... My Yandu, who's a little angel compared to this thing. Yeah, yeah. I've always wanted one. Um, yeah. So you have written a lot of books. Mm -hmm. a lot and the wild card i mean that's just mass it just keeps going right yeah i know <laughs> it does i mean it's 28 books published yeah. three more in the pipeline mm. uh, i've done a graphic novel that god alone knows if it will ever see the light of day because i can't get the artist we can't get the artist to finish the damn oh and it's driving me crazy because it's i i love i and I, I got finally got to write a graphic novel, and um, mm -hmm. and Lynn Bean, who created Swamp Thing and Wolverine, and um, Lynn was a dear friend, and and so I was able to go to Lynn and go, help me out here, <laughs> I need to talk to you. So I read a bunch of his his work and, and talked with him, and um, and unfortunately it's sitting there frozen. So I hope someday to, it'll see the light of day. But um, yeah, George and I've been doing this way more years than I want to mention, and we are developing wild cards for Peacock. Um, hopefully it will go and become a TV series. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know it's Hollywood, so I'm you know until the check clears, I don't believe anything about Hollywood. Um, but that's that's my life. That's my superhero stuff. Um, I I edit co-edit with George, and um, I've written for most of the books that we've done, um, and and it's fun. I mean, it's a, it's and it's a shared world anthology, so it's kind of like being in a writer's room at much slower pace than in arm's length because right. get to use other writers characters and they get to use my characters and and so we get to, and we exchange pages so we make sure the dialogue feels like like paul cornell and i i i write his character pretty well but because i'm not british i always send everything to paul and go okay is this good for abigail is this how abigail um and you know they do the same for my characters so mm -hmm. very collaborative it's a ton of fun um what else uh i have a big space opera series um yes. so this is book one it's called the high ground um mm -hmm. and you meet these characters at 18 and when I finish the final, well, the final book is done. It's uh, going to be coming out probably in September. They'll be in their 50s. And uh, this is book four. And you can, oops, there we go. There's the camera. And you can see that my wonderful artist has is aging them up beautifully. Um, and it's kind of fun to do something where you follow people, you know, from sort of foolish teenagers to, you know, battered <laughs> And battered adults who've been through a lot of difficult times, um, and it's it's at its heart, it's a story of uh, it's a love story, but it's also about a society in crisis. Because I used to be a lawyer, so I'm very interested in in issues of of uh, law, economics, um, rather than just space battles. I mean, there are space battles, but and then the other series that I do is. Um, comes out of the fact I used to be a lawyer. It's called the White Fang Law Series. And this is one, it's called This Case Is Gonna Kill Me. And um, it's actually sort of based on a case when I was still in a law firm that I had uh, wills and trust. And I'm working on a fourth book in that one. And then I have another series that we're reissuing, but it's not out yet. <laughs> so we're hoping um, that, uh, you know, hopefully that'll start coming out soon called the Carolingian series, which is about the war between science and rationality and tradition and religion and magic. And I come down on the side of science and rationality. Um, book one in that series, um, uh, Lucifer's War should be out hopefully soon. Um, and uh, that's the uh, same artist. I have this fantastic artist who's doing all the book covers for me. And I just, um, I love her work. <laughs> and, uh, I, may, I, I may need her info. info. Oh, she's, she's a Hugo Award winning artist. And she lives in New Mexico. New Mexico is sort of this weird little place oh. where you know, these authors yeah. and people in the arts and get out of that. <laughs> so... 
say hi. Say hi to everybody. Oh my goodness, look at those blue eyes. Yeah, get out. Oh. <laughs> um, so that's that's my other part of my life. There's there's the screenwriter part of my life, and then there's the book writer part of my life. And uh, and honest to gosh, going to Hollywood made me a much better writer of prose than uh, than I was before. I, I have to I have to recommend it because um, it makes you focus on what really matters and carrying yeah. the story forward. I was watching an interview with, and I can't remember her name off the top of my head. She does the voice for Lisa Simpson on The Simpsons. And I can't think of her name. Um, she was talking about how she got the role. And that when she got it, she was trying to be on stage. She wanted to be more serious. She wanted to be a true actress, not just voice work. And she started by thinking, well, this is a paycheck. Right. And then after a while, she said, but I learned so much. I would not have traded money for all the education I've got doing this and growth. And, and I thought about that, about being authors, because I, I, I took a job writing for an online game and I had the same idea. I'm getting in this because I didn't, I, authors don't exactly make a lot of money, especially if you're unknown like me. And so that was a great paycheck. But since I started working on that, it has educated me on writing right. so much mm -hmm. and I love it. And it's hard, <laughs> but I love it. So, no, you learn everything you do becomes something that you're bringing back to your work. I mean, every life experience, every bit of education, um, you know, and I don't know about you, but I sit, if I'm in a coffee shop or a restaurant, although COVID has made that harder, I'm constantly eavesdropping. If you hear some interesting conversation, you just know it's, you're going to yeah. put that in a book, you know, that's going in a script. Uh-huh. <laughs> Oh yeah, authors are terrible. We, we, yeah, we we we're, we're terrible about that. <laughs> I love people watching for book writing. I can come up. You can find some interesting characters out there, yeah. and interesting stories. Um, just don't yes. don't always advertise that's what you're doing because either they're going to get upset with you or they're going to try and tell you their story. Like you, they want you to write their memoir. No, <laughs> no. been there, not doing that. <clears throat> so I do want to ask because being a Trekkie. Uh, I read that background that that you started. That's when that was where you started in screenwriting. Which was your mm -hmm. submission for Next show. Gen? Yeah. So, um, what was that like? Um, you know, it was it was an amazing experience. I mean, I grew up on original Trek as a kid, little kid, and um, so it was to hear to stand on a soundstage and hear actors say your line, your dialogue. Mm. It's, it's an overwhelming experience. Um, it's also really scary <laughs> because you realize that they've spent thousands and thousands of dollars to build the sets and to do all this. And you're like, my God, I hope this is good enough to justify all the money that has been now spent on this. Um, I, I have to be honest, Trek was a difficult show. Um, it had a lot of turnover and, you know, there've been a lot of, you know, I know um, I was, you know, interviewed by Bill Shatner for Chaos on the Bridge because it's not unknown that behind the scenes, it was sort of mass craziness. Um, mm -hmm. But the work we did, I think overall, um, we did good work. I, I wish that, excuse me, I have cat hair all over me for some <laughs> unknown reason. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I wish that I wish that Gene hadn't been quite so concerned about his legacy and had allowed us to build more drama between the characters rather than having to always import drama from outside. Um, but he had become so concerned about how his people were perfect and the Federation was perfect. And and as a result, it, it meant that it was very hard to find drama, you know, to mm -hmm. drama. Um, which is why The Measure of a Man worked out to be something where there was actually intrinsic drama between the characters that didn't have to be imported from, you know, we have to deal with this war, or we have to deal with these other problems. Um, and, and I think that was one of the hardest things about writing for the show was that um, such interesting characters and we couldn't do as much with them as I think we would like to have. Um, Data was the only uh, exception, and I've always thought it was rather sad and ironic that the most interesting character was the robot, you know, <laughs> because we were allowed, he could make mistakes, he could 
misunderstand. He could do things. And, and so um, he was, it was a very rich vein to mine for, for good stories and for interesting scripts. Um, and it was harder with some of the other characters. Uh, so, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, to be on a, a sound, a lot, uh, you know, a movie lot, a studio lot, and then going onto a sound stage, uh, it's very exciting at first, and then it's incredibly boring. <laughs> and you start to, you know, oh, we're setting, resetting the lights <laughs> again. Um, you, you sort of the, 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 the wonder of it passes off fairly quickly after you've done it for a while. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was certainly interesting to, to get that opportunity. And I learned a lot. I mean, I, I, Ira Bear um, was a tremendous mentor to me um, who then went on to do Deep Space Nine. And mm -hmm. Ira is an incredibly fine writer and he was really, really helpful for me. He taught me a lot and help me hone my skills <clears throat> as a screenwriter so that I could then go on and get other jobs and work on other shows, all of which were lawyer and cop shows, interestingly enough. I mean, you know, I, and yet I'm known as the sci-fi writer and I have done, I mean, I wrote scripts for Odyssey 5 and um, uh, God, uh, Submarine Show, which I can never remember. Oh, Sequest? Sequest, yeah, I wrote an episode of Sequest and, I you know, that. I you did a lot of, you know, sort mm. of side work that was in the science fiction realm. I wrote the the two hour pilot for um, Outer Limits uh, based on George's Sand Kings. So, but ironically, a lot of my work has been on cop and lawyer shows. So, yeah, I, I say I say you lived you you lived my dream because I learned at a young age about the open submission they had at a time for Star Trek. And so I wrote my own Star Trek Voyager episode. Oh, okay. And by the time I felt confident enough to put it, send it in, I contacted the person I was supposed to, and they said, oh, we don't do that anymore. We stopped that last year. Oh, dear. <laughs> and so it just like crushed me. Now, of course, I, I still was in high school at this time. I, I wrote it, in, and then I turned it into a fan fiction book that I, no one's seen. Uh, <laughs> but, but you I, had fun, right? I mean, I you know, I, I think fan fiction is... I, I still commit fan fiction happily. Oh, yeah. I, I have I have fan fiction that people can see. I've got a, a Star Trek on my own version of Star, a Star Trek story that I've that Brian knows about that people have really liked. And I have a Star Wars story that I've, I've published. But my Voyager one, it needs work before I'll let people see it. But <laughs> it, it, it killed me because I really wanted to do that. I really wanted to be part of that. That, that was a dream of mine from a kid. It's just to be, have a piece of it. You yeah, know. unfortunately, it was um, Paramount got sued a number of times, you know, by Art Bookwald and other people. Um, it was not a great practice. I actually read a number of those scripts. I, I found Ron Moore's script in the submission file um, and brought it to the attention because he was so talented. Um, but it it also left the door open for abuse. And, um, and 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 abuse of the you know the young writers. Um, so I I I have very mixed feelings about it. Um, and yeah. I'm kind of glad to hear that they did stop it because um, there was there were just too many instances where things got quietly <laughs> lifted. And um, I you know I won't lie about it. Um, so that that was a that was a downside. I mean, yes, it's hard because it makes it hard for entry. Um, which is why you want to try to go out and if you could get a job working as an assistant um, for a writer producer, the odds are at some point that writer producer is going to turn to you and go, so are you interested in writing? And then if you're smart, you go, why yes, and here's my spec script. <laughs> and you immediately show it to them um, because that's how a lot of people get started. Um, and, and that's the other piece of advice I would give is if you're interested in getting into Hollywood, it's different now than when I broke in. At the time I broke in, you would write an episode of TV that was already on the air. Mm -hmm. Now they want to see original work from you. They want to see either your spec TV pilot or your feature film. 
because they want to know what you're interested in and what your voice is like um, when yeah. you're not trying to be a minor bird and imitate, you know, whatever TV show you're you're writing for. It's just a different a different approach. So. Yeah, I kind of left that particular dream a little behind me by about 20 years now. Because I've, I've actually had people, and my, my story I've written for the online game, which has been an on-running story, I've had several different people say, why don't you pitch that to Netflix? Because it's done episodic. It's pieces. And I'm like, that. I personally, yes, believe if someone took it, it'd be a really interesting superhero um, world that's not a mirror of Marvel or DC. However, I'm not a screenwriter. And I, I would, before I even thought about that, first thing I'd want to do is take screenwriting class or something to know how to do that. because. I mean, I can write. I, I was on stage for twenty years. I can write a play-ish, but a stage play and a screen, a script for screen. They're really different. Yeah, yeah they're, they're very really different. Are. I understand that. But we do have Mark Allen Bizant asked the question. He said, "Thanks for the story of Measure of a Man," because I mean, how you say that too? It was a, it was a really good episode. Mm -hmm. But was Data your favorite character to focus on since you also wrote Pen Pals? Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, Data wow. was far and away the character I wanted to write about most of the time um, because he could have flaws and you could do something with him um, and you could put him in difficult situations that he tried to, that he would have to parse and cope with. Um, so, yeah, I loved writing Data. And uh, I, I did a third Data script called The Instance of Command, which is the time mm -hmm. I, the only time I've been rewritten. Um, and if anybody's interested, my version of the script is up on my website under writings, along with my Mass Effect fan fiction, because I was so angry about the end of that game. <laughs> I wrote my own ending to Mass Effect. But anyway, both of those things are there. Um, and uh, but yes, I loved writing. And Brent was wonderful. I mean, he was wonderful to write for. Um, and and. Um, you know, just grabbed with both hands any anything you gave him to work with, and you know, just took off running with it. So, uh, yeah, I loved writing data. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, in that for for my superhero stories, when I have to take people's characters that they play the game, if they win certain things, their character gets either a mention or part of the story. Oh, fun, and, okay. and it and that's 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 a load of fun. My thing is, is I, I will sit down with them before I write it and consult because you give any average Joe Blow comic book fan the option to create a superhero, you're going to get a Superman God who can <laughs> do anything and cannot be hurt. And I say, I look, I'll look at them and say, this kind of character is unwritable. Right. Yeah. If they can solve every problem ever, there is no problem that I can create that makes the story interesting. So right. I will take their character and I'll say, okay, we're going to water their character down into a manual character, but I want to work with them and say, okay, where do you want your character to be that still is your character, but can work in a real story world? Right. So I, you know, I can see what you're saying. Writing for Star Trek, I can see what, especially in the Roddenberry years of next gen. Um, I love Star Trek. I still do. But as as Roddenberry tried to do with the next gen, he overcompensated with with his morality issues and all to the point that yes, the Federation was too perfect. Yeah, it, it, it just perfect people are boring, and perfect societies, utopias are boring. And uh, yeah, I mean, I if 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 CBS were to come to me tomorrow and say. What would you create if you were going to create a new Star Trek show? What would it be? And I would go. I would want to do the story about all the hairy mutts of the people living in the cracks. You know, all the people uh -huh. who are like just trying to make a buck. You know, yeah. and they're like, and their attitude is, oh my god, oh my god, it's the Federate. Oh my god, it's Starfleet. Um, I'll shoot. Hi. <laughs> you know, we're, we're trying. You know, we're just trying to make a buck, and here they are coming in, big footing us, and messing up our con. And I would want to do focus on those people. You know, where the, the, all the other the starships are like, oh no, not them. You know, I just think it would be a lot of fun. Um, you know, or do or do the kids at Starfleet Command, but make them kids. I mean, make them actually be, you know, 18 and, and stupid and hormonal and do yeah. all the things that would be, you know, would be fun. Um, but uh, they're not going to. So I'll just continue to, you know, create other things and do other shows and write other books.
You know, that's what I, I've actually talked at length at a convention about Star Trek, about why my favorite series was Deep Space Nine. Because in my opinion, there was more well-rounded developing characters, not developed, but developing characters. You start the show with a captain who has already got a hole in him. Right. He's not perfect, and he's working through that, and he struggles with it. And in fact, he begins the show by resigning and takes it back. And you know, I, and that right there, as even as a kid who loved writing, I looked at this and I said, "This show has options. The characters are not perfect. I mean, Bashir seemed perfect, but he wasn't. You know, Jadzia seemed perfect, but she wasn't, and it, and it came out. Whereas it wasn't as strong in other series, you know." And I think I think that's one reason why I love DS9 particularly was that. Well, like I said, Ira is you know a great writer and yes. uh, you know a very good showrunner. Um, I you know I have to make a confession, which uh, you know um, when I said Trek was difficult, it was indeed difficult. And as my friend Ricky Manning says, Star Trek with the S and the T and PTSD. So I've actually never watched any other Star Trek shows. Um, I I can't. Um, I have this sort of strange, uh, you know, it's like yeah, PTSD. <laughs> you know? So I have, and and I love Christopher Pike. I mean, in some ways it was breaking my heart about Strange New Worlds because I, somebody asked me once at a panel, a Star Trek thing, they were interviewing me. They said, if you had to, which captain would you want to serve under? And I went, Christopher Pike. And they were all like, what, why? And I said, well, he could make Spock smile. Um, and he was clearly such a fantastic commander that Spock would risk his career to go and bring him to that Thalos, whatever that planet was. Yeah, and he must have been incredible. Um, and so I, but you know, PTSD. <laughs> so, so uh, okay. Mark asked the question: um, Who has been your favorite Doctor Who companion? Oh, companion. Oh, gosh. I know, that's a hard one. That is a hard one. That is a really hard one. Um, what does that mean? I don't watch the show. Does that mean the do the person the doctor carries the traveler, brings the around traveler? traveler. Okay. Yeah, that he has adventures I, with. Ooh. Gotcha. Okay. I have well, mine, but she's not actually a companion, but go. what's yours? Yeah. Well, I love Sarah Jane. I really did because mm, she yeah. was a very self-assured woman, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and then would i say rose i i don't know um god that's really hard i mean um help me out here doctor who fan writer i i'm trying to remember, is it bill um there bill was, was under the the um um uh, Cabaldi. 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 Cabaldi, yeah. Bill was under Cabaldi. Bill was good. I liked her. Bill was good. I liked Bill. Bill. Was good. That was a really um, interesting. But I would say Sarah Jane and and probably Bill. Yeah, and they're both they're both very uh, Bill Potts. Um, they're both very strong. And what I liked about both those characters is that they started and continued with the ability to take Doctor Who by the arm and go no and pull him out of what he's doing, whereas the oh, other ones yeah. followed him into it. But I I have to say for me. And she's actually not technically a companion, but one that fills is River Song. Oh, God. Well, River is, I mean, but yeah, oh. she's not a companion. I mean, I know. She, I, if, yeah. I, I, I love her. I loved her. Uh, yeah. Her character. Her character inspired me to write another character because I loved that character so much that I created someone similar to her for a fantasy book. But it was just that that personality, that oh, presence, yeah. that oh, reverence. Every time she showed up and went, hello, sweetie. I was yes. like, yes. yes. I know I loved her, but I guess I just didn't, I don't consider her a companion so much yeah. as a, as a contemporary, you know, she stood shoulder. I mean, she could match him moment mm -hmm. for moment, you know? Um, and of course, I mean, again, he's not a companion, but I loved Captain Jack. I mean, yeah. I, love him <laughs> so um oh, Do donna, donna was good. on watching doctor who i i just things have been kind of covid world and things have been crazy and i'm i'm behind a little bit on my on my watching i need to get finish getting caught up so i i'd say mark says here um uh, he liked ace and donna 
Donna was the companion that was. Oh Dr. yeah, Donna. Donna. Yeah, Not she in was... intelligence, but in drive. I did like Donna. I liked the character of Donna because of her comedy. She was strong, but she was hilarious. hilarious. But that was because the actress was first and foremost a an established, yeah. well-known comedian. Yeah. A comedian, and she. In fact, that's why she got back on Doctor Who's because the fans were like, "We love her," and they and they they brought her back for that. And her first are you, episode, are you, huh? Are you talking about Catherine Tate? Yes, Catherine Tate. I love her. I love her. Yeah. Oh absolutely. my gosh! The first episode in which she is actually joins the Doctor, where she's searching for him. The scene between them talking to each other through the windows is bar none one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. Because it's so it's so stupid funny. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was. But that's it. I mean, and and um, you know, again, it's 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 alchemy. You know, who you cast and how those two actors, you know, will mm -hmm. will mesh, and some work better than others. You know, it's just it's uh, it's alchemy. So. I, I respect the writing for for Doctor Who for the most part. I it, it as a series. It was. It amazed me at how well he was able to. The writers um, were able to weave and intertwine the the stories back and forth so much, and yet keep it all connected in such a way that you don't feel like you're lost. Yeah, you you always kind of. I mean, you know, um, I I just yeah, I, I love the Doctor. I mean, I I discovered it suddenly um, when it was in reruns on PBS with with Tom Baker. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, for me, I guess my doctor is um, is is eh, this is awful. I'm blanking. My brain is. I'm running through all the Doctor Who's. Tennant, David Tennant. David um, Tennant. Mm -hmm. Go from being charming to being so scary, alien. Um, Family of Blood to me is by that Paul Cornell wrote. Oh um, yeah. One of the most powerful two-parter episodes of Doctor Who ever, 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 ever. Yeah, I, I've actually told people that. I said that episode, just watch it for the conclusion. Oh, wow. just yeah. Just watch it for how it actually ends because all the way through it, you're not going to expect how it what, ends. What they and, do, what he did. Yeah, yeah. no. It, 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 it kind of breaks you a little. I mean, it's just so powerful. Yeah, yeah. and Tenet is scary. He is downright scary, and, and he doesn't seem human. And that's why I think I, you know, love him so much. But of course, uh, again, the story by now, he how he got the role of the doctor is is great. He he threw on the costume first and ran in for his audition in costume. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that, and he was and and he wasn't expecting to be the doctor. He was actually expecting to be a different character. <laughs> oh. And they just went you. <laughs> I mean, come on. So, anyways. Um, any other question? Oh yeah, Mark says a scene where he has ingested poison and they can, they're in the kitchen trying to find a cure is one of his favorites. Yeah, yeah, that that again, great. They 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 threw in some, some wacky comedy in that show that just was great. <laughs> so okay, so um, your newest book. So what what is your newest book? Um, Currency of War. That's Currency of the War. most recent new book that's out. Right now, um, mm -hmm. it's book four in the series, book five, which concludes it because I always end a series. <laughs> I hate unfinished series. Um, will be out, like I said, probably September. Um, it's mm -hmm. called Thucydides Trap. Um, and it concludes, I mean, I, I'm trying to come up with the next, I mean, when you create a universe this big, you're like, I got to keep writing in it because <laughs> I created this incredible universe. But I'll probably jump ahead a few years and pick up with um, maybe the next generation or maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm noodling with it, but I've got other books I'm writing and I'm writing a couple of screenplays right now and developing some shows for television. So mm -hmm. kind of busy. <laughs> busy. Yeah. Back of my head right now. So, um, but yeah, I, if anybody is interested, I mean, um, I love to answer questions and uh, to try to be a mentor because I had a lot of great mentors. I had Victor Milan, I had George Martin, <laughs> I had my bosses on Star Trek. Um, so, you know, come find me um, on Facebook uh, or send me an email through my website or, um, and, you know, we'll chat. 
Um, I'm not as good about posting on my website as I should be because I've got, you know, Twitter and Facebook and social media is overwhelming right now, <laughs> but uh, trying to keep up with it. I, I admire you for doing a podcast. And I mean, I'm like, God, how would I even add that in? <laughs> you know, I to, yeah, I, 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 and I'm, I'm doing two of them. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Oh, God, I don't know how you can do it. I mean, I, I can barely manage to get everything done and feed myself because COVID, you know, I, I've i also stopped for the moment going to comic book conventions just because um, I, I have an autoimmune uh, disease and I'm a little nervous about being in a convention center with 80,000 friends, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Like, mm, you yeah. know, so uh, right at the moment, I'm sticking kind of close to home. But, but I miss being in Bard's Tower. I love being in the tower. It's so much fun. I get to join for the first time this year. So well, you're going to have a blast. Um, you're going to have a blast and you're going to meet some great people. Just it's, it's a great crew. So Mark has one last question. He asks, oh. which is harder, a novel or writing a novel or a screenwriter? Oh, for me, writing a novel. It's far and away harder. I was born to be a screenwriter. Um, I love writing dialogue. Um, in fact, I and I hate writing description. Um, that was the primary note I would get in our writers group was beautiful dialogue, Melinda. Are they in a white room? <laughs> you know, where are these people? Um, no, I find novels to be much harder. Um, and I just love writing scripts. But bottom line, I love writing. I mean, I. I get twitchy if if there's a day when I don't get to write. I just, I find it fun. I mean, I've never understood this attitude that some writers have about, I like to have written, but I don't like to write. And I'm like, really? I love to write. I, I love those moments where the right word comes or you know that sentence, ooh, that's good, I've got it. You know, it's, it's yeah. uh, it, you never stop getting better and you never stop learning. And that's what's so yeah. remarkable about this career. Yep. Well, um, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, thank you. Been Sorry, very was... <laughs> it, have worked a... out. it worked out. We got it figured out. I now oh, know how yeah. to use StreamYard, which I've never used StreamYard before. So now I have a new app that I can actually use. So. Yeah, okay. I love StreamYard. We've been using it for a very long time. Um, I find it very easy. Um, so I have put the link for your books for Amazon, and there are other places as well. I'm going to put your links for your website. Um, and, of course, um, oh, God, I've been saying it all day, and now I just drew a blank. Uh, Prince of Cats, Prince literary, literary locations. Per, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, you can get it there as well. So. Yes, you can go directly to Prince of Cats, and he will send you. Um, he will send you one of these beautiful books, and they are my God, you know, <laughs> they are really nice. <laughs> so, yeah. well, thank you, gentlemen. I had a lovely time. You guys take care, stay safe, have fun, enjoy. Well. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming on. Here. Uh, next. Sure. Next week, uh, I'm not, I don't have a guest slated at the moment. Um, I'm off off again to another convention, so uh, I don't know what, what the show is going to look like next week. But we will uh, see what we have. Uh, so, but if you're in the Knoxville area, if you are in the Knoxville area and you want to go to Rocky Top Game Con, contact me. They gave me a whole bundle of free passes to hand out. So if you are in that area, let me know, and I will give you a pass. You can come to the convention. It's a smaller convention. It's not a big one. And uh, there's the, the celebrities there are mostly artists and people like me. So, uh, um, But it's a, it's a fun thing to do. And if you want to go, let me know. Um, and after that, uh, it won't be till July that I'm in my next event, which is going to be in Lansing, Michigan. So... One of these days, Brian and I will be in the same room, and you will all be confused. And yes. more, almost as much as we'll be confused. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, 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 if, if that day ever comes, I will make sure that we somehow do some sort of show right then and there. Uh, that day. So, yeah. Um, okay. So Don't cool. forget about both of our podcasts as well, besides this mm -hmm. um you can 
find us on all of those platforms that I mentioned earlier. Hi. Oh, you're up here, huh? Um, all the pets are joining us today. Yeah. So Joshua of Egypt, chapter chapters one two. and two are are there. So people want to um, take a listen. Um, Spreaker, you know, you name it, any platform, it's on, and we're adding more uh, platforms. Um, you have mine as well. Fear on the high seas. Listen to it. Um, I'm already up to chapter eight. I gotta start writing chapter nine. I'm almost done. And then I need to move on to my next series. Um, yeah, it's it's getting good. We have lots of stuff. And Heroes Rising fans that are on here, um, lots of stuff's happening in the game. Uh, the patrol that's currently running, you want to finish it because we have something big coming in that. And then, of course, the beginning of June is our birthday for the game. Third year in operation. And we're ha we have a bunch of great stuff planned. So uh, just stay ready. And we'll have fun with that. So I will say good night, everybody. And thank you for watching. Bye, everyone. So thank you for being here. And hope to see you next time we're on. Yes.